This is Orson Welles. And here's another radio show brought to you by Lady Esther. Tonight we have three items for your approval. A romance for you who like romance. A love poem for you who like poetry or love. And a grisly little thriller. We start off with a thriller. <laughs> search for flesh, and a mantle of winter lies like a curse upon the forest. It was just such a winter's night as this that Ulrich von Gradwitz patrolled his dark forest in quest of a human enemy. Three generations before his, this strip of woodland had been the disputed boundary between the von Gradwitz lands and those of Znaim's. And now the feud had grown to a personal quarrel between himself and George Znaim. It was Znaim he hunted now, even as Znaim hunted him. Tonight, if only tonight we meet, Znaim and I, man to man with none to witness. That was the prayer he made, and it was answered. For just as he stepped around the trunk of a huge beach, he came face to face with the man he sought. But Gravitz! The two enemies stood staring at one another for a long, silent moment. Each had a rifle in his hand. Each had hate in his heart and murder uppermost in his mind. But in that moment of hesitation, a deed of nature's own violence overwhelmed them both. Look, Niam. Look! The tree! The great beech tree above them had been torn by the wind and now crashed down, pinning them both helplessly under its branches. Oh. Oh. You're not killed, Tom Roberts. I'd hoped differently. No, you. More's the pity. You're caught anyway. <laughs> caught fast. What a joke this is. Ulrich von Roberts snarled in his own stolen forest. <laughs> There's real justice for you. Caught in my own forest land. The land that belongs by legal right to me and to me alone. <laughs> you may laugh if you like, Snyam. But when my men come to release us, it'll be my turn to laugh. For I'm sure you could wish yourself in a better plight than caught poaching on a neighbor's land. Don't be so sure your men will be here first. You seem to forget that I also have men in the forest tonight. Very close behind. There's no doubt they will be here first. Indeed. Indeed. But after they've dragged me out from under these branches... It won't take much clumsiness on their part to roll this massive trunk right over on top of you. Your men will find you dead under a fallen beech tree. What more natural death than that? My men had orders to follow me in ten minutes. Must be all of seven since I left them. So at any moment now, we'll hear them coming through the forest. And believe me, my dear Sniam, when they get me out, I shall remember your little plan, for it was a very clever one. Only unfortunately for you, it will be executed in reverse. Oh, good. Good. Then we fight this quarrel out to the death. You and I and our forest. Oh. You're in pain, Snyam. You're badly hurt. If I am, how does it concern you? I have no wish for your sympathy. I was only making conversation. The sound of our voices drowns out for the moment this beastly screeching wind. Listen. Is that men coming? No. Only the branches beating in the wind. Snyam, oh. Snyam, oh. Snyam, I managed to get at a wine flask I had in my pocket. If you could catch it, I'll throw it to you. There's good wine in it. Let us drink, even, even if tonight one of us dies. I can't catch it. I, I can't see there's so much blood caked around my eyes. In any case, I don't drink with an enemy. Neighbor, do as you please with me tonight if your men come first. It was a fair compact. As for me, neighbor, I've changed my mind. I'm serious. If my men come first, you shall be the first to be helped. As though you were my guest. I don't want your help. 
I made a compact, I shall stick to it. I expect you to do the same. We've quarreled like devils all our lives over this stupid strip of forest. Lying here tonight, thinking I've come to realize that there are better things in life than quarreling over worthless land. Neighbor, if you'll help me bury the old quarrel, I'll... I'll ask you to be my friend. Your friend? How the whole countryside will stare and gabble if we ride into the market square together. Why, no one living can remember seeing us, Zion, and the von Grodbitz talking to one another in friendship. Then we shall give them a story to tell their grandchildren. If we choose to end our feud tonight and to make peace among our people, have none to interfere, no interlopers from outside. That is true. I would go and keep the Sylvester night between your roof, and you'd come and feast one high day at my castle. I never thought to want to do other than hate you all my life. Tonight, I think I've changed my mind about things, too. You offered me your wine flask. Ulrich von Grodwitz, I will be your friend. Thank you, neighbor. Now more than before, I pray that my men come first so that I may be the first to show honorable attention to my enemy who's become my friend. And I, too, pray the same. The wind has died down a bit. Perhaps if we shouted for help in this lull, our voices might carry... It will carry far through these woods. But we can try. Hola! Let's try again. Hola! I thought I heard something. I wish I could see. I can see. I can see figures coming through the woods. They're, they're following the way I came. Hola! Hola! They hear us. I can see they stop. Now they see us. Yeah, they're running down the hill towards us. How many of them are there? I, I can't see distinctly. Nine or ten. And they're your men. I had only seven. And they're coming fast towards it. I... What's the matter? Aren't they your men? Are they mine? Ulrich, what is it? Who are they? Ulrich, answer me. Answer me. Are they your men or mine? They're not your men. They aren't mine. They're not men at all. They're wolves. you just heard was, for the most part, Elliot Lewis. Ray Collins played George Nyam, and Ulrich von Gradwitz was enacted, for the most part, by your immediate servant. The latter two actors may be seen in your favorite theater in a motion picture with the interesting title, Citizen Kane. What's the moral of that story, Mr. Well? Citizen Kane, Jiminy Cricket? No, no, that nasty old wolf story. Oh, that. Don't make friends with your enemies or the wolves will get you. That doesn't sound right, Mr. Well. Have it your way, Jiminy. It wasn't wolves those men saw. It was a troop of Boy Scouts with St. Bernard dogs. Pretty music, please, Mr. Bernard Herman, who composes and conducts the music for this program. <laughs> Today is Michaelmas Day of the Feast of St. Michael and all the angels. In England, they commemorate this day in two ways. First, they have a goose dinner, and second, everybody pays his rent. They say that Queen Elizabeth was eating a Michaelmas goose when she got word of the defeat of the Spanish Armada. That seems quite natural, since St. Michael is a patron saint of seafaring men. On the west coast of France, a fisherman named a bay after him and built one of the world's great cathedrals in his honor, Mont Saint-Michel. Today is also Leif Erikson Day. There isn't much reason to doubt that Leif Erikson discovered America 500 years before Columbus. Altogether, today's a fine day for seamen. Horatio Nelson should have been born on this Mariner Saint's Day, and he was. Nelson was the doughty admiral who defeated Napoleon at the Battle of the Nile. That was the battle where the boy stood on the burning deck. The boy stood on the burning deck. His feet were plenty hot. He wished that he was home in bed, but that's where he was not. Jiminy, that isn't the way the poem goes. Well, that's the way I heard it. You've been keeping bad company. Oh, no, Mr. Wells. Maybe ignorant, but not bad. Excuse me. Okay. Well, now it's time for you to tell the people about your poem. 
Well, as I said before, it's a love poem. The most intoxicatingly beautiful I know in all literature. The Song of Solomon. among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. The voice of my beloved. Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the window, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come. And the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Oh, my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet, and thy speech is comely. Thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. Thy neck is like the Tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers all shields of mighty men until the day break and the shadows flee away. I will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine. Thy lips, O oh my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue. Thou art beautiful, O oh my love, as Tirsa, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. stop to think that face powder can lie about your age? That it can make you look a little older than you really are? Did you ever stop to think that face powder, instead of flattering the skin, can actually do just the opposite? Can make it look drawn and tired? Now there's an old proverb that says, nothing tells the truth like a mirror. So look in your mirror and see how old your face powder says you are. Look closely. 
and see how much your face powder really does for your skin. Can you truthfully say it makes your skin look smoother, fresher? I hope the face powder you use doesn't act like a sly traitor that shows up the little lines in your face, makes the pores look bigger. I hope it doesn't make your skin look even the tiniest bit older. You see, there's a new and flattering kind of face powder now that hides little lines, little blemishes. It gives the skin an instant new softness and even makes it look younger. So many women write and tell me that's the most thrilling thing about Lady Esther face powder, the way it makes the skin look younger. You'll say it's like magic to see the change that takes place in your skin, how it takes on new warmth, new life, well, there's a very good reason why you get such different results from Lady Esther face powder. It's a new and different kind of powder. It's made by my exclusive twin hurricane method, which makes it much softer, much finer than powder usually is. And so it goes on a new, smoother way that makes the skin look smoother, too. Yes, and younger, and fresher. If you try Lady Esther face powder, You'll see the difference in a glance, right on your own skin. You'll see instantly why more lovely women now use Lady Esther face powder than any other kind. And now here's our love story. Sherwood Anderson's I'm a Fool. It began at 3 o'clock one October afternoon in 1912 as I sat in the grandstand at the fall trotting and pacing me to Sandusky, Ohio, and it all came about through my own foolishness, too. Even yet, sometimes, when I think of it, I want to cry or swear or kick myself. To tell the truth, I felt a little foolish I should be sitting in the grandstand at all. I got the day off and went to races, and I had on my good clothes and my new brown derby hat and a stand-up collar, and I had $40 in my pocket and three 25-cent cigars and a drink of whiskey inside of me that was bought me at the West House by a fellow with a cane and a Windsor tie. What's your choice, gentlemen? Get your bets down on the face race. What are you giving for Farmingham? Five to two, Farmingham. Five to two. Five to two for Farmingham. Fourteen to two, one now I go. Fourteen to two. Get your bets down on the face race. Gee, it was fun being on a track again, and there was my old friend Bert French standing around with his horses. Hello, Bert. Why, hello, Joe. Hello, stranger. How have you been, Bert? Never better. Have you got any money, Joe? Sure. How'd you like to watch it grow? Oh, I like it fine, Bert. All right, come over here, then. I'll tell you something. Listen, Joe, in the second race, the 218 pace, there's a horse I'm handling, Abdul bin Hamid. There he is, oh, number yeah. seven. That gelding's as fast as a street, Joe. Belongs to a fellow called Mathers in Marietta, Ohio. We got him marked at 221, but he can step an eight. Gee. In the first heat, don't you touch him. He'll go around like an ox hitched to a plow. After that, you go right down and lay on your pile. Thanks, Bert, a lot. Have a cigar? Thanks, Joe. What's your choice, gentlemen? Get your bets down. Three, two, one, five, eight, What's your choice, gentlemen? Get your bets down the place, right? Well, sir, I went and bought myself the best seat I could get. And right in front of me in the grandstand that day, there was a fellow with a couple of girls, and they was about my age. And the young fellow was a nice guy, all right. He had his sister with him and another girl, and the sister looked around over his shoulder accidentally at first, not intending to start I think She wasn't that kind, and her eyes and mine happened to meet. You know how it is. She, she was a peach. She had on a soft dress, kind of blue stuff, and she blushed when she looked right at me, and so did... So did I and she was the nicest girl I've ever seen in my life. And pretty soon the horses came out to the 218 pace, and there was Bert's horse in among with the red. Well, what did we bet on this time? You know as much about it as I do. What about the brown one there with the long tail? He's kind of cute. Heck, man, that mare couldn't beat a streetcar. They looked up kind of surprised, but they didn't seem mad. And anyway, I'd done it now, and I might as well go on. Maybe I can help you folks. There's a horse in this race, number seven. That horse is as fast as a streak. What's his name? Uh, about Ben Aham. But look, don't don't go betting on the first heat, because he'll pace it like a lame cow. But when the first heat is over, go right down and lay your pile on about Ben Aham. He'll, he'll come right out and skin him alive. That's what I told him. Gee... And, and what did that young fellow do but have the nerve to turn and ask the man next to him to get up and change places with me so I could sit with his crowd? I want you to meet Miss Eleanor Woodbury. Pleased to meet you. And this is my sister, Lucy Wesson. My name's Wilbur. We're from Tiffin, Ohio. I suppose it was their having such swell names got me off my trolley. And then that girl, oh, you know how fella is, that something that kind of nice clothes and the kind of nice eyes she had and the way she looked at me a while before over her brother's shoulder and me 
looking back at her and both of us blushing. I couldn't show her up for a boob, could I? I made a fool of myself. That's what I did. Glad to know you all. My name's Walter Mathis. How do you do, Mr. Mathis? From Marietta, Ohio. And you really think this horse is going to win, Mr. Mathis? Then I told him all the smashingest lie you ever heard. I said my father owned this horse about Ben A.M. and it was supposed to be a secret because our family was proud, never gone in for racing that way. Here's what I think of that horse. Wilbur, will you do me the favor when you go down to place these 30 bills on about the Anim at, at, at whatever odds you can get? I'd go myself, but I just soon our trainer and the swipes didn't see me. I'm supposed to be here keeping an eye on him incognito. Just about then, the first heat came off. Oh! Sure enough, about then A.M. went off to stride up the back stretch and looked like a wooden horse or a sick one come in to be last. See, folks, what did I tell you? <laughs> like a lame cow. You certainly were right, Mr. Mathers. Then this Wilbur Wesson went down to bed and placed under the grandstand, Miss Woodbury with him, and Lucy Wesson and I was left alone, like on a desert island. In it, in it. Fresh roasted peanuts, two bags for a nickel. But a popcorn, popcorn crisp, and strawberry bars. Peanuts. But a popcorn, popcorn crisp, and strawberry bars. Yeah. Gee, Miss Lucy, I'd like to show you our place down at Marietta. On a hill. Great old red brick house with a stable behind it. Way up on a hill. High above the Ohio River. I like Lizzie. Her eyes were shining and she kind of... With her shoulder, you know, kind of touch me. You know, the way a woman can do, they get close but not getting gay either. You know what they do. Oh, gee. Gee whiz. I began to wish I was on the square with her and to see what a fool I'd been. There wasn't any way of getting myself on the square now. There ain't any Walter Mathers, like I said to him. There ain't ever been one. But if there was, I bet I'd go to Marietta, Ohio, and shoot him tomorrow. And then Wilbur Weston came back with Miss Woodbury, and he'd gone and bet $50 on this horse, and the girls had gone and put in $10 each of their own money, too. Gee, I was sick then, but it came out okay. There he goes! Then A.M. stepped the next three heats like a bushel of spoiled eggs going to market before they could be found out. Look at him, Mr. Mathers. Look at him coming up. About Ben A.M. About Ben A.M. Now he's third. About Ben A.M. He's coming up. About Ben A.M. Oh, Mr. Mathers, he's going to win. We all got nine to two for our money, and after the race, we had a hack downtown, and Wilbur stood us a swell supper at the West House and a bottle of champagne beside him. There I was with that girl, big boob that I am. She wasn't saying much. I wasn't saying much either. One thing I know, she wasn't stuck on me because of the lie about my father being rich and all that. There's a way you know. Christ almighty. Gee, that's the kind of girl you see just once in your life, and then if you don't get busy and make hay, then you, you're gone for good and all. You might just as well go jump off a bridge because what it means is you want that girl to be your wife and you want nice things around her, like nice flowers and twill clothes, and you want her to have the kids you're going to have and good music played and not rag time. Gee whiz. Well, there's a place over near Sandusky across a kind of bay, and it's called Cedar Point. After we'd had supper, we went over to it in the launch, just the four of us by ourselves. What time's that train, Wilbur? 10.40. And is that the last train? Yeah, that's the last train. Over at Cedar Point, there was a beach you could walk along and get where it was dark, and we went there. She didn't talk hardly at all. Neither did I. Go on ahead. We'll wait for you here. I feel kind of tired, don't you? Yes, I guess so, Miss Lucy. Why don't we sit down a while? It's nice here. Lucy and I sat down in a dark place where there were some roots of old trees the water had washed up. Mm, feel that wood. How smooth it is. It's like silk. And there was a watery smell. And the night was like as if you could put your hand out and feel it. So warm and soft and dark and sweet. Like an orange. After that, the time till we had to go back to the launch and they had to catch their train wasn't nothing at all. Went like winking your eyes. Lucy! Lucy! Nearly ten. Lucy! I've got to go now. We've got to go to the train. Will you 
kissed me goodbye. She was most crying then. But she never knew nothing I knew. She couldn't be all busted up as I was. Gee whiz. Sometimes I wish I'd never been born. I guess you know what I mean. We went in the launch across the bay to the train like that, and it was dark, too. What are you thinking about? Gee whiz, if only she knew. You know what I was thinking? What? I was thinking that you and I could get out of this boat right this minute and walk in the water. Sounded foolish, all right, but I knew what she meant. Then quick, we were right at the depot, and there was a big gang of yaps crowding and milling around like cattle, and how could I tell her? It won't be long, because you'll write, and I'll answer you. I got a chance like a hay barn a fire. Swell chance I got to answer. Oh, maybe, maybe she'd write me down at Marietta that way, and the letter would come back and stamped on the front of it by the USA. There ain't any such guy, or something like that. Whatever they stamp on a letter that way. Oh, goodbye, Walter. Oh, Thanks for the tip-off. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Maddox. Goodbye. 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 When that train went, I busted out and cried like a kid. Gee, I could have run after that train and made made any horse look like a freight train after a wreck, but... Oh, socks of mighty, what was the use? Did you ever see such a fool? Me trying to pass myself off for a big bug and a swell to her. Did you ever see such a fool? I'll bet you what, if I had an arm broke right now or a train had run over my foot, I wouldn't go to the doctor at all. I'd go sit down and let it hurt and hurt. That's what I do. Big fool that I am. Oh, I'll bet you what, if I hadn't drunk that booze, I'd never been such a boob as to go and tell such a lie that couldn't ever be made straight to a lady like her. I wish I had that fellow right here that bought me that drink. I'd smash him for fair. God darn his eyes. He's a big fool, that's what he is, and... If I'm not another, you just go find me one. I'll quit working and be a bum and give him my job. I don't care for working and earning and saving it for no such big boob as myself. Ladies and gentlemen, that was I'm a Fool by Sherwood Anderson. Now, I'm sure you've heard how hard it is in show business to get what's called a break. That is, a chance to show what you can do. Well, we like to think it isn't quite so hard in the Mercury Theater. Tonight, for instance, the part of Lucy was played by a young lady who has never been on the radio before. She's 15 years old, and she's just as beautiful as she sounds. Her name is Nancy Gates. I'd like to congratulate her. In just a minute, I'd like to tell you about next week's story, too. But first, a word from Lady Esther. If I were to tell you that you could take the roughest skin of your body and make that skin look soft and smooth, you'd hardly believe it, would you? But here's a test that will prove what I say. Just pat a little Lady Esther face powder on your elbow. Then look at the elbow that was so rough and coarse an instant ago. See how smooth it looks? How lines and rough spots seem to have vanished? If Lady Esther face powder can do that to the abused skin of your elbow, just imagine what it can do for the skin of your face. Imagine how it can hide little lines and blemishes. Make the skin look younger. Make this test and see for yourself how Lady Esther face powder flatters your skin. And next week, this program is going to be chiefly concerned with a story called The Black Pearl. Uh, Mr. Wells, you know that pearls are white. Well, most of them are, but this one is black. And it's therefore rare and strange. That goes for the story, too, which is about a girl who saw in the black pearl all the things she wanted in life. I plan to tell you a little more about her, but our time's just about up. I think it's enough to say that Dorothy Comingore of the Mercury is a girl. Till then, speaking for Lady Esther and for all of us in the Mercury Theater, I remain, as always, obediently yours.